look at combustion basics. I want to go all the way back to the very beginning with a chimney. Here, here's a basic old boiler and a chimney. The reason I use the word chimney is there's, there's no fan here. There's no fan. The, the air going into this combustion process has to be induced by a tall vent or a tall chimney to make sure we got enough air to draw and make sure the products of combustion are put out the top of the chimney and not into the space or the mechanical room where this work where this equipment is installed. This would be true of some old, old stuff, but we've got to start here because of efficiencies and so you understand the process. So if you have a chimney, no fan for the combustion, how much air does it take? Well, you've got to have the combustion air. Let's call that kind of the, the, the primary air. You've got to have it and a little bit of secondary air just to make the burners work and get them going. And you've got to have excess air. Let's call it dilution air. You've got to have enough volume of that excess air to get that chimney to draw. Because you've got hot combustion products, you've got to draw. And you've got to have some excess air to make it flow. And, and that works out to be, on the right-hand side there, roughly uh, 50 SCFM for every 100,000 uh, MBH on a gas appliance. Now, we're talking a lot about gas today. And before we uh, get too far away, if you can believe what we read in the papers, the USA is sitting on two to 300 years worth of natural gas. And the price of natural gas has come down, and we would be predicting it would be pretty stable. So you're going to see, in my opinion, a lot more natural gas applications. Even your electric utilities are going more and more right now to gas, natural gas, for gas peakers. And it's just going to be the, the fuel looks like of the future. So it's a good place to be talking. So these are non-condensing boilers. They are working with no, working with no fans with a chimney, and that's the kind of the combustion process and the excess air process we want to look at. Now let's take a little bit closer look. Basically, you're lighting a match to natural gas. You're creating a byproduct of heat. Combustion products are going up the chimney, and this chimney has to be sized on 100% capacity because that's the worst situation. Because the chimney has to be big enough to handle full fire, full modulation of the bore. And when you start down below 100%, the chimney stays the same size. All practical purposes, the amount of air going up that chimney stays the same, even if you're only firing, say, 50% fire. Kind of keep that in mind with this excess air thing, efficiency, and what it might be doing. So let's look at this basic combustion process a little bit and see if we can tie some of the stuff together. This is very fundamental, very basic, but it's worth repeating. So I've got the natural gas here. Let's call it methane. You know, CH4 would be uh, the basic molecule we're dealing with. So we're bringing natural gas in, and we're bringing an O2 mo uh, molecule, oxygen, in with it, and we're going to strike a match and make it <laughs> and make it fire off. What happens? Well, in that combustion process, as you see from the slide here, we're getting heat. Heat to hit a domestic water, heat to hit a hot water, whatever we're trying to do here, this is what we want is the heat. That's fine. What else do we produce in this basic fundamental combustion process? As you see from this, we generate carbon dioxide, CO2, hopefully going up the chimney because we've got a hot chimney going out the top. And the interesting thing is, if you haven't looked at it lately, we create water vapor, H2O water vapor molecules are created in the combustion process. And that's interesting because this is created as a gas. And this gas normally would be going up the chimney. And again, I, I like simple things. You know, you can go back to your old steam tables. You take a close look. If you take a pound of uh, condensate, a pound of water, and you want to make it into a pound of steam at zero, takes roughly 1,000 BTUs, actually maybe 980, 985, but let's just use 1,000. If I got a pound of steam, and I'm going to condense it back to a pound of uh, condensate, pound of liquid, then I'm going to have to give up 1,000 BTUs per pound. If I've got a cooling tower, which is an evaporative animal, and I want to make the cooling tower work, I've got to evaporate water. So every pound of water I evaporate in a cooling tower, I soak up. 1,000 BTUs. So let's go back to my combustion process. What, what I'm trying to tell you for every pound of water vapor going up this chimney from this combustion process, 
you are throwing away a thousand BTUs for every pound. So the question kind of becomes, how much water vapor are we creating here? And it's going out the chimney, and we're throwing it away. So that's what I want you to get out of this basic water or basic process. One more comment here. In a non-condensing appliance, then we are throwing it out the chimney. And if we let it condense, if we let the temperature in the stack get too low, if we let the return water temperature to our boiler get too low, then this water vapor is going to condense. And if you condense the water vapor in the stack, what is it mixing with? It's mixing with CO2, carbon dioxide, and water create what? Carbonic acid. It eats you up, carbonic acid. So you kind of see how all this kind of goes together. And we get talking non-condensing where there's a water vapor going out the top versus a condensing appliance where it's raining in the bore and the CO2 is mixing with it, we've got carbonic acid to deal with. That's the two key things you kind of need to learn from this chart, and we're going to talk more about it as we go. So if I take this, uh, this, 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 this 1,000 BTUs of the water vapor, it's called latent heat. It's called hidden heat. If I look at natural gas, how much of the energy content of the natural gas is sensible? That's what you can feel, by the way. That's what you can put your hands on and feel versus latent. And it's roughly 90% of the energy content of natural gas. If you can get to it, it is sensible heat that you can feel. Roughly 10% in the combustion process of natural gas converts itself over to water vapor. And if we're non-condensing, goes up the chimney and we throw it away. Ah. So what you're saying, Chris, is possibility we could get this latent heat in this water vapor going up the chimney. Maybe we want to condense that and get that 1,000 BTUs, that 10% back into our board to heat our product. And that's kind of where we're going. But the important thing to do with natural gas is understand this ratio of about 90% being sensible and about 10% this hidden latent water vapor going up the chimney. So you kind of tie all this together a little bit and you start looking at efficiencies, which is the reason we would do any of this to begin with. Let's take a quick look, and, and, and this is just one, one characteristic of an efficient bore. This chart kind of plots the percent CO2 in the stack versus the condensing temperature of the heat exchanger. In other words, if you let the heat exchanger get below these temperatures, that water vapor is going to condense. And it's going to rain in the boiler, and we've got a liquid in there along with the CO2 we've got to deal with. But it might be important to kind of begin to grasp these numbers. We're going back to my chimney. See, my chimney was sized for 100% air. So if I got excess air, and remember CO2 is a byproduct of combustion. So by looking at percent CO2 in the stack is one measurement of the efficiency. Not the only one, but it's a place you start taking a look at the efficiency of the boiler itself. So as you see here, as I increase the percent CO2, your efficiency is actually going up. And as you increase the, efficient, the, efficient, the, the percent CO2, you're cutting down on the excess air. So if you've got excess air, then your percent CO2 has got to go down. If you match your combustion air directly, your percent, percent CO2 goes up. So basically, as your efficiency kind of goes up, the percent CO2 is going up, and look at the condensing temperature. In other words, if I'm at 3% uh, excess CO2, which means I got a lot of excess air, I got a chimney size for 100% fire, and I'm back at 30% fire, my condensing temperature is what, maybe 90 degrees? So that's pretty easy. That means I can have the condensed water temperature coming back at 90 or above. I'm okay. But as I increase the efficiency, and I, and, I, and I get my percent CO2 up, say, to 10%, as the blue dotted line shows here, then my return condensing temperature is about 130. In other words, at 10% CO2, a fairly high efficient boiler, if I let the return water temperature get below 130, then that water vapor is going to condense. It's going to rain in my boiler, and I'm going to perform with the CO2 carbonic acid and I've got a condensing boiler going on, whether I want it or not. So that's the key thing to look at, is that return water temperature is the point you need to make for me. What is the dew point? 
what is the point it will rain in my boiler. As I go through this process, you'll find roughly natural gas at a pretty efficient appliance. If you have returned water to it below 130, it's going to begin to rain. That's pretty much the dew point. Dew point's been where the water vapor goes to a liquid water and you give up the BTUs. Anything below about 130 degrees with natural gas, a decent modern appliance, you're going to start raining in your boiler. So that's kind of the threshold between designing for condensing versus non-condensing boilers. If you go to a million BTUs of natural gas, you just, you're buying natural gas, you're paying money for it. If you go to a million BTUs and you burn that million BTUs, you light a match and you burn it, you produce 93 pounds of water vapor per million BTUs. Let me repeat that. I want to keep simple things here. 93 pounds of water vapor is being generated for every million BTUs of natural gas you use, roughly 10%. Now, we just agreed a few minutes ago that each pound would be, what, about a 1,000 BTUs of heat energy is in that water vapor that if we condensed it back to a liquid, we get the 1,000 BTUs back. So if you send this up the chimney, what are you doing? If you are throwing away 93 pounds of water vapor up the chimney, you are throwing away 93,000 BTUs. Ah, so now you begin to see why this condensing thing is so important to understand. If we could condense that safely and not tear a boiler up, we could get back 93,000 BTUs. We could pick up 10% in efficiency roughly. If we did it perfectly, we could pick up roughly an additional 10% in efficiency in a boiler by going condensing versus non-condensing. And that's the message you need to take. We can't keep doing this. We can't keep spending a buck on fuel and throwing away a dime. It just doesn't make any sense. And that's why the world has changed. We've been doing some surveys of our own people. Uh, very rapidly, this has happened in the marketplace. We're seeing roughly 90% of the new boilers being quoted being condensing boilers. Repeat that. Roughly 90% of the new boards we see in this day and age are condensing because you can't keep throwing away a dime for every dollar in fuel. It just doesn't make any sense. We're even seeing the same thing take place with water heaters. The water heaters are a little bit slower getting there, but we're probably around 50% of the new water heaters we see commercially now are going condensing because of this dime. They want to get that 10 cents back. So let's go back a little bit further and, and kind of make sure you understand all this. This, this is uh, some laws that we can't change about the condensing. It's been going on a long, long time. The old cast iron boilers had the same issues. Now, these were huge boilers, lots of water in them. We had, a, we had an insertion Honeywell Aquastat that kept these boilers 160, 180, whatever it was, hot enough that we didn't have to worry about this condensate forming on the heat exchangers. If it did on the cast iron boilers, it did rust. It did pit the boilers. The old timers knew this, and we learned how to stop that by doing what? Making sure the return water temperatures were above 130, and it stopped. So that's kind of the message, and the old timers knew all this. So what's changing now? What, what's happening? Well, we're asking you now to slow down and change the way you think. We can no longer design boilers and hot water heating systems the way we used to. If you're going to buy a condensing boiler, and 90% of the people are, don't you want it to rain in your boiler? Don't you want it to condense? So we have to make sure we do get that latent heat. Why would you pay for something and not get it? Why would you pay more money or go to a more sophisticated boiler to get the condensing latent heat and then design a system where it won't work? The key thing is you've got to start looking at return water temperatures, not supply the way we've always been taught, all supply is critical. I didn't say it was not, but you can't look at that in condensing water. You've got to make sure you look at the return water temperature and make your supplies whatever you need to to be below that magical number to rain. Have a great day. Thank you very much.